And, and I just, uh, I think all of them are kind of important for Thanksgiving week. They all kind of lead something to the story, so I kind of wanted to share all of them. Uh, but first, from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. When you have entered the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land uh, that the Lord is giving you, and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. And say to the priest in office at that time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord swore to our forefathers to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, My father was a wanderer, wandering Aramean, and that he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, the Lord, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the, the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. And you and the Levites and the aliens among you shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given you and your household. And then Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And then back to John chapter 6, verses 35, 25 to 35. When they found him, speaking to the of the disciples they had found Jesus. When they had found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you were looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to spiritual life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work, of the, God, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give me that, that, that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Uh, we pray, Father, that as we go through the lesson this morning, we'll better understand each of these passages. We'll glean something as we look to Thanksgiving 
and, and our hearts and in the passages that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Back in 1929, the Depression was going pretty good. And in, in November, time for Thanksgiving, uh, the stock market crashed in October, about five weeks before Thanksgiving. There, there were already signs of a severe depression in the country. And, and that year, a group of ministers in the Boston area were trying to decide what to do about Thanksgiving. Maybe they should kind of not ignore it, but at least uh, not dwell too much on Thanksgiving this year. Because after all, there's, there's not an awful lot to be thankful for. Maybe we feel the same way today. Um, but back then, there were, uh, there were signs of, of there were no sign of relief in sight. There were uh, long bread lines. The stock market had, had literally tanked. The word depression was a pretty good word, uh, denoting not just the economy, economic conditions, but the mood of the people in general. Uh, there was a lot of depression around at the time. And the ministers thought that maybe they should just lightly touch on Thanksgiving today. We don't want to remind people how bad it is. We don't want to remind them how little they have. Maybe we'll just lightly touch on Thanksgiving this year. Um, after all, not much to be thankful for. But Dr. William Steiger suggested, he was the pastor of one of the larger churches in Boston, and he suggested that to give a mere mention to Thanksgiving um, isn't what we need. We need just the opposite. We need a full-blown kind of Thanksgiving. This year, more than ever, this was the, the time for the nation to get matters into perspective, to realize who's really in charge, to realize who is the author of the gifts and blessings that we do have. Uh, to thank God for the blessings that are always present, but sometimes hard to see uh, because of all the hardships that we face. Now, you know, we can always find things to be depressed about. We can always find things to be upset or, or leery about or depressed about. Uh, there are always things that make us a little bit nervous about the future. There's always negative news reports. There's always um, disunity. There's, there's the TV news telling us about every bad thing that's, that's ever happened anywhere. Um, there's, there's politics. I think even in light of the election two weeks ago, there's, uh, there's still a huge divide in our country today. Um, all kinds of reasons to be leery of, 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 of these times. Maybe you're struggling with something even more personal. Maybe there's a hardship you have, a, a sickness or an illness or a, a family trial or something that you're going through. That's, that's uh, maybe loss of a loved one or loss of work or insecurity in your job. Uh, maybe you have health concerns. Maybe there's, uh, maybe there's something else going on that's, that's making it a little difficult to get into the Thanksgiving mood this year. Uh, making it a little difficult to, to be thankful. For, for about Thanksgiving this year. Uh, it might not be that easy to find things to be thankful for. If that's where you are, I'd, I'd like to suggest that maybe the words of Dr. William Steiger might ring true for you. Um, that, that maybe he struck on something worth remembering. The most powerful and passionate times of thankfulness are not found in days of plenty, when we have everything we want, when everything's going great. But rather, the most powerful moments of thankfulness are found in times of want, when difficulties have us struggling. Think about the pilgrims when they celebrated that first uh, Thanksgiving. That was 399 years ago this year, 399 years. It's a long time, right? But, but that group, at least half of them, had died in the two years prior to William Bradford's declaration for, of a day of thanksgiving. These were people literally without a country. They had left everything to get on a small boat and, and to set sail, not knowing where they were going, but knowing wherever they wound up was going to be home. Um, they were suffering hardships we can't even imagine. But yet, they took a day of thanksgiving 
a day to be thankful for God. Their attitude was not for something, but in something. They put their hope not for something, but in something. Or maybe better said, in someone. I suspect it was that same sense of gratitude that Abraham Lincoln uh, had in his heart when he declared the first day of Thanksgiving uh, after our country was founded. Uh, in the midst of the Civil War, when the list of casualties had no end. And, and the more I hear about the Civil War and the more I study the Civil War, and I don't know that much about it, but, but I'm struck by what a brutal war that was. Um, I don't know if you ever studied that war or, or really looked into that war, but, but they lined up in open fields facing each other, not that far apart, and, and just shot each other up. I mean, their guns weren't that accurate, so you had to be really close. And they would be really close. In fact, so close that in the time that, that it took you to reload your single shot weapon, that wasn't very accurate to begin with. The other line could have easily charged and stamped you with their bayonets just in the time it took you to reload. Thousands would die in a single afternoon. Um, estimates at Gettysburg, 50 to 55,000 losses on both sides. Um, 50 to 55,000 men were killed in a single battle. That battle lasted three days, but, but that's a lot of people. Um, we, we think of wars today, and 3,000 casualties, 5,000 casualties is a lot. But 55,000 in an afternoon, in three afternoons, three, three battles, making up that, that Gettysburg struggle. Um, brutal, brutal. And in the midst of all of that happening was when Abraham Lincoln called the nation together for a time of Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, perhaps in your own life right now, you're going through some suffering. Maybe you're going through a, a, an extreme hardship. Uh, I hope not, but, but maybe there's something in your life today that's keeping you from feeling that, that attitude of gratitude, that, that thankfulness. Um, struggles you're, you're facing may make it difficult to, to celebrate Thanksgiving this year. If so, I want to suggest what what, what Dr. Steiger suggested, that, that there's no better time to, to give thanks for what you have than a time when you're struggling. Our readings this morning can give us hope as well. Uh, they may give you a reason to be thankful, even to celebrate the blessings and mercies of God. In that Deuteronomy passage, we heard about that celebration. That was the, what became the festival of the first fruits. Uh, they were to do this each year, bring the first of the harvest each year, and remember uh, what God had done for them. Moses gave them a reminder of, of some of the things that they had to be thankful for. Just to summarize basically what, what Moses said to them, um, your father was a wanderer, but your people had become a great nation. You were once slaves in Egypt and were badly mistreated and abused, but God heard your cries and led you out of Egypt, giving you this land, overflowing with milk and honey. I suppose they needed a reminder of that. After all, they just spent the last 40 years wandering the desert. Uh, maybe they needed a reminder of, of things to be thankful for. Teacher and author David McClellan writes, uh, his, in one of his books he mentioned his very first job was as, uh, they called him a handyman, handy boy, in a general store in the town he grew up in. Now this was long before malls and, and chain grocery stores and that kind of thing. The town had a general store where everybody came to get whatever they needed. And, and at 13 years old, he would sweep the floors, he would bag groceries, he would stock shelves, he would do basically whatever was necessary. Uh, one day he heard the owner of the store say to one of the clerks that it's getting to be that time of year again, time for an inventory. Well, McClellan had never heard that word before. He'd never, you know, what is an inventory? What does that mean? So the next time he was alone with the store owner, he, he asked him, what, what is an inventory? And, and very patiently, the store owner explained to this boy that, that, that they're going to have to count up everything in the store, uh, make a list of everything they had, from, from groceries to wrapping paper to string, everything we have. And, and the boy just kind of looked at him somewhat puzzled and said, but why? 
And the other said, well, it's easy to forget how much you have every year. Every now and then you just have to stop and, and take an inventory just to see what all you have. And McClellan goes, goes on to talk about how it's important for us as Christians to do that too. To take a look at the gifts and blessings that we have every year. Just stop and take an inventory of those spiritual gifts we've been given. I think that kind of sums up what Thanksgiving is all about. It's a time when each of us has to take an inventory of our life. To make an effort to, to count out all the gifts and blessings we've received in the last year. And then take a day to celebrate those gifts and blessings. To just be reminded of how gracious God has been to us. Um, looking for uh, and celebrating the times that you've seen God in your life. Perhaps it's a shame we only do this once a year. Our second reading from Philippians told us that we should always, that we should always do this. Um, Paul told the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord always. Every day should be a celebration of the gifts and blessings that God gives us. He told them, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. We should be acting in the spirit of thanksgiving every day. Rejoicing in God's gifts to us. No matter how difficult the year may be going, we can still rejoice with thanksgiving. For what we do have. One of the things that makes Paul's comments in Philippians so important for us to remember today is that Paul wrote those words in prison. And if you know anything about prisons in, in the Roman day and age, they were basically a dirt floor and stone walls, mold, mildew, nothing. They didn't provide anything. For their people. Families or close friends had to come in and, and give them whatever they needed. But even in that setting, even in, in a jail, a, a, a murky, musty jail, Paul was rejoicing in what the Lord had done for him. He's telling us to rejoice in all things. And he's telling us that from a prison cell. Where even there, he rejoiced in all things. I think Paul's attitude can, can teach us an important lesson. And, and this is something we need to remember. This is something that, that if you get anything out of this morning's message, I hope you get this. Our inner attitudes don't have to reflect our outer circumstances. Our, our inner attitudes don't have to reflect our outer attitude, our, our outer circumstances. We talked earlier about some struggles you may be going through. If you're going through something like that, just understand that your inner attitudes don't have to reflect those outward circumstances. These struggles and hardships don't define you. Paul could do this because he knew that no matter what happened to him, even in that jail cell, that Jesus was with him, no matter what. And we as Jesus' disciples now know that Jesus is with us no matter what, no matter what struggles we're finding ourselves in. Uh, we know that Jesus is with us. If you know him and you believe in him and you cling to him, then nothing can happen to you that he won't help you through. Paul urged the Philippians to be thankful in all things. It's, it's so easy to get discouraged when things don't go the way you hoped. But don't let those discouragements rob you of your joy. Don't let the struggles and hardships take away the peace that Christ gave you. If that's been happening to you, then get back to Jesus. Look at your struggles from his point of view. Realize that he is more powerful than anything you're going through, and, and let him help you through. How do we realize that rejoicing and attitude of thanksgiving in our own life? I think that our reading in John will help. Prior to this passage, we read in John that Jesus had fed the 5,000 people gathered on the mountainside. Most of the people had, had seen some of his miracles and they were following him because they liked the miracles. It's not that they necessarily believed in what he was saying. They just liked to watch him perform miracles. 
Um, the healings were miracles. Feeding 5,000 people with a couple of loaves is a miracle. They kind of wanted to know what he was going to do next. It was like going to a magic show. So they followed him to find out what he would do. They were just looking to see what he'd do next. Um, they, they had seen several miracles, and then they even got a free meal out of it. They were just going to hang out with him just to see what was coming. Um, that's why by the end of the chapter, most of them turned away and, and no longer wanted to follow him. That's why, that's what he's trying to teach them here. They needed to believe in him. That was his message. They asked him point blank, as clear as they could, what must we do to do what God uh, requires? And Jesus answered them just as clearly. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Believing in Jesus is what we must do to do what God requires of us. That's it. Just believe in him who God sent. We know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have life everlasting. Believe in him. 1 John 3.23, uh, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he's commanded us. Here's one final thought on that. When, when, when we look at what does it mean to believe in Jesus. It's not enough to just believe that he existed. Or, or even it's not enough to know that he's God's son. That's kind of all head knowledge. Um, in, in fact, James tells us that even, even the devil knew that and trembled. But the devil wasn't saved, was he? So it's not enough just to believe that. It's, it's about clinging to him. Um, that's the image for us, to cling to us. Uh, who did Jesus say at the end of that passage? He said, I am the bread of life. What is bread to our, to our life? It's our provision, right? It's our sustenance. It's, it's we can't survive without bread. Bread represents food. We can't live without food. We need it. Believing in Jesus Christ is knowing that we can't survive without him. He is our bread. We need him. And just as the bread may be eaten, must be eaten to sustain daily life, we need to look to Christ daily to sustain spiritual life. When we learn this, when we learn that he is our everything, then we can easily see his hand at work in all things. Then we can, we can give thanks for all that he's done as they did in Deuteronomy. Then we can rejoice in all things, as Paul told them in Philippians. And then we can experience that, that attitude of thanksgiving no matter what comes our way. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for, for all that you've done for us. On, on Thursday, we get together with our families and we give thanks. Uh, I pray that it not be just another meal with the family as we are so often in the habit of sharing, but, but that it's something special, that it's something where we remember the gifts and the blessings that you've given that you are there at our tables with us, uh, that your graciousness and your mercy uh, just fill our hearts on that day and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.